that. So uh, I'm glad you guys could come out tonight. I'm going to be talking about, as, as Joe said, just so you guys pace yourselves mentally, I'm going to keep this kind of abbreviate. I'm going to go about 30, 35 minutes tops for these remarks, then leave the balance of the time for your guys' questions and answers, because I'm sure uh, with a crowd of with, with this diverse interest that that'll be more lively. I talked to, I've met a lot of you beforehand, so it's, it's going to be tricky because some of you you know, you're lifelong fans of Ludwig von Mises and, you know, you know all his work inside and out. And others, I think, are just kind of uh, people who who may have heard that I was coming. Uh, Jim mentioned that they were surprised there were a lot of walk-ins, apparently underestimating how many of my fans can't turn down free sandwiches. So um, I know my people. Uh, let me, before I forget, just make a quick little plug. Uh, so I'm with what's called the Free Market Institute. I would use the thing but the red wouldn't show up anyway the free market institute so that's relatively new it's at texas tech university that's in west texas lubbock texas um and it's a, it's an or it's a group it's its own little center um and we it's sick we were we're hiring we're in the midst of hiring now we're like seven or eight uh we're all economists so far but all free market, Austrian friendly, and we have a graduate, you know, we, we grant PhDs through that program. So if either people here who are considering that or if you know people that are undergrads who want to go somewhere and get a PhD in economics, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the program they have at George Mason. So we're trying to, you know, establish something like that down in Texas. So by all means, just want to spread the word since I said, like I said, we're still relatively new. A lot of people aren't aware of us yet. So what am I talking about? Let's see. Do I need to turn this on or is this? Dun, dun, dun. Can, can we get a Heartland person to help me out with this thing? I'm just trying to get that to advance. There you go. All right. Okay, so I'm talking about my book choice. Uh, this was from the Independent Institute. And what we were trying to do, the, the mission they gave me was they said, you know, Bob, we, we think Human Action by Ludwig von Mises is the most important economics book of the 20th century, perhaps even, you know, some of the, one of the top economics books ever written. But unfortunately, a lot of people haven't read the thing. And many of you, I just from talking, you know what it is. But for those who don't, it is an intimidating book, Human Action is. It's 900 some pages. Mises writes in a very um, dense style, so he wrote it in English, but he, you know the Germanic b background is there. Like the sentences are very German-like, if you get what I'm talking about. His, he has a very um, hard vocabulary. I was gonna take a, a copy out here just to show you guys how thick it is, but I was afraid that the Heartland security would tackle me at the door, thinking I was stealing their book. But it is a very intimidating book. But yet, on the other hand, it, it's it's crucial, right? And, so, and I know a lot of even self-described Austrians, fans of the Austrian school. Um, you know, ha haven't read the thing, and so the the task they gave me is: we want choice to be something that's 300 some pages, captures the essence of human action, all the really important stuff, and yet could plausibly be assigned to an undergrad economics class. You know, so c can you do that? So that would that was the mission that I was given. I think we we pulled it off. And as far as you know, some people are worried. Well won't that make people not read human action? I, I would like to think it's the other way around, that if people read choice, you know, and I explain what goes on in human action, that will lead more people to it. It'll be sort of like the gateway drug, if you will. Um, and so I, I would like to think that Mises would give it the thumbs up if he were here. So now let me dive in. Again, there was a, a lot of topics I could have covered. If we had more time, I would, I would go into it. So I'm, I thought, I'll just I'll pick a few key things just to try to explain to you guys, number one, why is Mises so important as an economist? Like he really was a true theorist, an innovator in the field. So I'm going to try to explain some of his major contributions in that realm. But then also he is, you know, he was more than that. He wasn't just an academic. He also spawned a bunch of disciples, if you will. And so I'm going to try to get you to see that. Because what, what I want people to understand is why is it that there are some of us who really cling to that label Austrian economist. Let me just mention it. I don't want to leave people behind in case you don't know that term. So the Austrian school is, is a school just like there's the Keynesian school or the Chicago school. And so this, it was founded in 1871 by Karl Menger. And so the name comes, it's not because they study the GDP of Vienna. It's because the founders happen to be from the country of Austria and the, and the label just stuck. All right. But it's a school that uh, focuses 
on explaining economics from the individual level. So instead of having mathematical models of the economy relating you know, the money supply and velocity of circulation to the average price level, stuff like that, that's not at all what the Austrians do. They try to explain the logic of individual human action and then build up things. So, yeah, they can talk about the business cycle, and that's what I'm going to work on in this talk with you guys. I'm going to lead you up to Mises' explanation of the business cycle. So they can talk about macro stuff, but they try to ground everything in the, the actions and the decisions of, of individual humans. And they you know, acknowledge up front that you can't mathematically model human behavior. Right? So that's one of the things. So it's true. In practice, Austrian economists tend to be very free market in their policy prescriptions. In fact, even more so than Chicago school economists, as we'll see. But that, that's not, it's not that they're, that that's, you know, oh, you're Austrian because you're free market. No, it is its own school of thought, its own discipline that has it, their own views as to this is the way we, we learn economics. So I'm going to touch on some of that. Mises was um, hands down the, the, the most popular uh, exponent of Austrian economics in the, in the 20th century. Among economists, his disciple Hayek, you, many of you have probably heard of, it was someone who studied, you know, learned his stuff from, from Mises and ended up winning the Nobel Prize. So many people in the United States might know of Hayek as an Austrian economist. But Mises, just to give you one example, Hayek says that he was young, when he was younger, he was a socialist. And it was through reading Mises' book on socialism that converted him. All right? So that's just one example of the kind of influence Mises had. So why, uh, this top part, why do we call it human action? You know, that's the name of his his treatise. So where, where does that term come from? Well, it's as opposed to why didn't he just call his book economics or something like that? Or, you know, how, how does the economy work? Why did he call it human action? It has to do with the way Mises conceived of what is it that we're doing in economics. And so what he thought it was is that economics was just the best developed branch of this broader field that he called praxeology. And so what that is, it's the, it's the study of, of choice itself. The fact that people engage in rational behavior. The fact that they have a purpose in mind. Okay, so here, I don't, I don't have time to dwell on this too long. And a lot of us, we, we just take it for granted, but this is a really key insight where Mises was explaining, you know, what is the difference fundamentally between what the social scientist does versus the natural scientist. And, you know, that he, and he said the social scientist assumes there's purpose involved, there's intentionality. All right, and to give you a silly example, if you say um, you're a physicist and you're, and you're saying, oh, why did that rock, you know, it, it went up like this and then it came down, moved in a parabola and then came down. Why did it do that? And, you know, modern scientists would talk about mass and gravity and things like that. But you wouldn't say, oh, because at first the rock decided it wanted to get away from the ground, then it had second thoughts and changed its mind, right? That, it's not merely that that wouldn't be helpful. That doesn't even sound like science, right? You, you would say that's not, it's not just that that's wrong. That's not even the right kind of explanation, at least the way we think of natural science today, right? Whereas if you see an airplane start to go up and then it turns around and comes back, well, well, explain those observations. It's perfectly natural to say, well, maybe the pilot wanted to go to Albuquerque, but then halfway up they realized, you know, the bathroom wasn't working, so they turned around and came back or something. You know, it, there's that type of language. That might be wrong. Maybe it's going to turn out when they land, oh, no, actually they didn't have enough fuel or something. But that's the right kind of explanation, right? It's perfectly acceptable when you're trying to explain the action of human bodies to start attributing motivations and preferences to it and reason to start you know attributing beliefs and knowledge of how the world works and say oh the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to achieve this goal and they believe doing those things will lead to right so there's a lot involved when you give an explanation to describe the actions of somebody else's body when you're attributing intentionality to it right so I'm just, again, just touching on the surface here, but that's what Mises thought the fundamental difference was between the natural and the social sciences. And so, again, he, he wanted to conceive of this thing called praxeology, which was the sub subject matter of studying rational choice per se. And that word rational, for him, just meant there are reasons behind it, okay? So, um, in particular, the way Mises used the term action He's distinguishing it from reflexive behavior. So if somebody goes into the doctor's office and, uh, you know, and the, the doctor takes out the thing and hits him on the knee and his leg goes up, that's not really human action. 
Okay, but if instead the doctor says, okay, go see the receptionist to pay your bill, and the person jumps out the window, that is action, right? The person, you know, for anticipating consequences, weighing the pros and cons, and picks the, the least painful course. All right, so let me now um, explain a little bit. So Mises, um, part of what happened here is, is he said it was the historical transition from the classical economics to what's called modern subjective value theory. So modern in this sense means as developed in the 1870s. And again, so economists like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, those, those are classical economists. And you may not know this, but they actually held either a labor or a cost theory of value. So some of you might have thought, oh yeah, the labor theory of value, that's some discredited Marxist notion. But actually Marx got it from people like Adam Smith. Okay, so it's not that the labor theory of value goes hand in hand with socialism. It's, it, it was the older way that economists explain prices. But that was overturned by Karl Menger in 1871 and two other economists who are credited with the, what's called the marginal revolution. All right, so what happened, Mises points out early on in, in his book, Human Action, that he said there was, as part of that revolution, it wasn't simply that now economists had a better way of explaining market prices, that before this, this pivotal event in the 1870s, economists would explain prices by saying, okay, how much, how much labor power went into it? And you'd figure out like the inputs and then figure out, okay, so the price of this has to be enough to cover the cost of the, of the inputs. And so you were explaining final prices by their costs. And there's various reasons that that was a dead end. That doesn't really work very well. What replaced it was the modern subjective theory. Where they say the reason stuff has value is that it's subjective. That if, you, if you're looking at a good, you're a consumer, you don't care how it was made. You don't need to know its history. You just need to know its properties and the way it can satisfy your preferences. Okay, so if it's a bottle of wine, you technically don't really care how many years went into making it. All you care about is, you know, what, what can it do if I, you know, want to have a party or something? I know that this bottle of wine can, can help me out, right? So, and that, that affects how much I'm willing to pay for it. So a lot of the truisms of the classical tradition, you know, were, were correct, but the, the cause and, and effect were, were flipped. But what Mises pointed out was it wasn't just a little tweaking of, oh, yeah, this is how now we explain market prices, that that approach to say, oh, we're going to explain market prices by getting inside the mind of the acting consumer, that revolutionized social science, and he realized that's you know just one aspect of a broader new field of explaining systematically people's uh, subjective values and their and their actions that flow from those those preferences. So, and that's why he's now calling you know calling it human action and saying economics is a branch of it. So the analogy I use for what I just talked about from going from classical to modern economics is imagine if if there was the study of archery like in the, in the middle ages or something and they had rules of thumb like oh yeah if you want to hit a target that's so much so much distance away you know the angle you, you put the the bow at you know in order to hit the thing and there could be books published giving you rules of thumb that might be pretty successful insofar as they went to explain how arrows move once you let them go and you could get some people who are really good at that you know give very good advice about how to hit a target under certain conditions oh if there's wind here's how you adjust and so on and so on but then Isaac Newton comes along and explains to you the laws of motion and gravity and so on. And then all those earlier laws about archery, would you, you would see, oh, wait a minute, these are just specific applications of this more fundamental stuff. And from that point forward, you would not have just a booklet on archery anymore, right? The laws of, of arrow motion or something. You see how that would be silly. So it's the same kind of thing here where Mises is saying, yes, the specific thing that the breakthrough it came in explaining market prices, but once we made that intellectual transformation, we couldn't just stop there. This was now this whole new field that he was calling praxeology. Okay, let me spend a minute on what's the most controversial part of Misesian thought. Uh, but and when I was younger, first getting into Austrian economics and reading Mises' stuff, this part you know I, I could take it or leave it I didn't really care one way or the other I just wanted to get to like the the real economics how does the economy work but the older I get the more I read Mises the more I think this is pretty fundamental so let me at least just explain where he's coming from so the, it has to do with the founding or, or the foundation of economics and the, the method that we use so how is it that we deduce economic principles or laws if you will so if you talk to most modern practicing economists 
they're going to really want to make sure you know that they're, they're scientists. And so they're going to say, oh, we come up with hypotheses that have testable implications, and then we go and get the data, and then we see how well did our theory match the data, and if it didn't match, then we throw it out and look for a different theory or hypothesis, right? So they want to show you we're being empirical and good scientists, we're not ideologues. But Mises thought, they actually know that that may be, and that's even like a, a, a loose version of what they do even in the hard natural sciences, that process I said is, is kind of naive, that's actually not how they do it in, real, in the real world, but for sure that's not what they do in the social sciences. And Mises thought that actually what you're doing in pure economic theory is you start out from axioms, for example, that humans act, and then you logically deduce implications from that. So the... Um, the analogy, it's in case, so a lot of, let me just mention, so a lot of critics read Mises' writings on this topic, and they think, he's like, man, this guy sounds medieval. Like, he sounds like, you know, like the church scholars or something arguing about things that are, you know, with, with no empirical gr grounding in, you know, how, how do you ever know if you're wrong, if you're, if you're not going to go out and look at the world and test your, your theories? Like, that, that's the understandable reaction they have, and they think it's unscientific. But I would point out that here it's, don't think of it like physics, think of it more like geometry. All right, so here, you know, this is the Pythagorean theorem, if some of you may remember this, where it says, oh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and there's ways you can prove that. Okay, so this goes back, obviously, a long time, and, and how long humans have known that. So the idea is, if I want to convince you that that's true, that for a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I literally can prove it to you, right? I mean, not right now, I didn't prepare, but one could do it right? And it would involve something like this. What I would not do is say, okay, everybody take out a piece of paper and, you know, take out a ru some rulers and then draw right triangles and then measure this. And then we'll see how many of you come up with this being true or not. And, you know, hopefully most of you would come up with it. And the few that said, no, it didn't work out, we would go and look and say, oh, no, you didn't really draw a right triangle or you measured it wrong or you did something wrong, right? You see what I'm saying? We would not empirically test that. When you're going to prove something in geometry, you literally prove it such that you do it and if the demonstration's compelling, the, the student says, now I see that, that's got to be true. I don't need to go test it out in the real world, that's true. If it seems like it is wrong in the real world, it's because one of the, the assumptions was, was not tr true. Okay, so some of you may know that the physicists don't think our world is actually Euclidean and stuff like that, okay, but there, it's not that Pythagoras was wrong it's that maybe the universe doesn't satisfy the axioms of his geometry, okay? But his proof was valid. So that's what Mises thought economic theory was like, that you, 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 know, you deduce things logically. So stuff like um, other things equal if the supply of gasoline goes up, the price of gasoline goes down. Okay, I can prove that to you once you allow me to teach you what do I mean by the terms like supply and price and things like that. Once you have those concepts, those definitions down, I can prove that, yeah, what I just said is true. Other things equal, the supply goes up, the price goes down, and you don't need to go test that. If in reality the supply goes up and the, and the price also goes up, I'm not going to care. I'm going to say, no, it must be the demand went up too, so other things weren't equal. Okay, And it might seem like, oh, gee, well, then you can never be wrong, and what's the point? You're just art. But you can see, no, that's, that is still valuable, just like the Pythagorean theorem and other things in geometry are certainly valuable to humans. Okay, that it's, it's not just that we're arguing in a circle or we're just spinning out mere tautologies that don't tell us anything about the real world. Actually, it does. That's why we study geometry. Okay, so one analogy to try to motivate that, I say, suppose Martians showed up tomorrow and they, um, you know, and we're communicating with them and it turns out they don't know about the Pythagorean theorem and we somehow tell it to them in, you know, in their language they're going to be excited and think we just told them something about reality, and they're going to transmit that back to Mars, you know, and, and tell them that, and they're going to tell the Martian mathematicians. And they're going, oh, wow, we know something more. Good thing you bumped into those humans. But if instead we told them, oh, the word bachelor in English means unmarried male. Yeah, we told them something about the world, but it was really a bit of trivia about our conventions. You see how that's a different kind of knowledge? Whereas the Pythagorean theorem, we have a sense that there's something deeper there. That's like how the universe is built or, or how reality or our mind works. Whereas to give them a definition of what does bachelor mean to us, we're not really telling them something about the external world. Right? So you, you get the, the distinction there. So by the same token, if I teach you 
a bunch of introductory economic principles, stuff about how you use supply and demand curves, I think you, you walk away from that knowing more about the world and being able to interpret things, even though technically the stuff I taught you, you can't go test it and see if it's true or not. It's just it's giving you a framework to go help make sense of the world. Just like with geometry, if you want to go build a house or something, I think that's probably going to help you that you studied that, even though you're not going to go first test it to make sure these things are true. Okay, so that's, that's the framework. Now, having said all that, let me... Um, Oh, let me mention that the middle point here, if that sounded odd to you, I would just ask you. So for those of you in this room, probably, I mean, I was making a joke about the free sandwiches. You guys probably showed up because you're fans of, of free market economics, right? And, and so I'm, I would ask, why is it that you believe in the free market? Is it because you looked at a bunch of regressions when you were younger, right? And you saw, like, oh, wow, there's three asterisks here. This, is, this stuff must be true. No, that's not what happened. It's because you read something like by Thomas Sowell or Walter Williams or Frederick Bastiat or Henry Hazlitt, Leonard Reed, that were thought experiments, like, you know, essays that didn't give you a bunch of data but just had you think through the logical implications of stuff. And you, oh, now I see it. Of course, free trade makes sense. Or, of course, the minimum wage is silly or whatever, okay? But it was just getting you to think a certain way, and then you saw some, some principle. Okay, so th that's what I mean about saying that, you know, Mises thought that was the foundation of basic economic principles. Now, having said all that, this last bullet point here, don't take me to be saying Mises thought data were irrelevant and, you, you know, you just need to go to the library and just get out a piece of paper and that's all you need. You know, he and Hayek actually founded a center to study business cycles, all right? So they certainly focused a lot on empirical things. Okay. Let me, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I want to hit the business cycle stuff. So Mises, one of his contributions was uniting micro and macro economics. Okay, so let me explain the big picture of what he did here. So after the marginal revolution, which I talked about earlier, economists still were using two frameworks. One, to explain what we can call barter ratios, like how many horses trade for how many pigs, that kind of thing. That, that's what they were using this new marginal subjective framework for. But then to explain the absolute level of money prices that, oh, a horse trades for eight gold coins and the pig trades for two, there they had this framework of how many gold coins were there and what was the velocity of circulation in the economy. And so if you notice, that's a totally different framework that doesn't involve individual choice. And so it seemed odd that they were explaining individual subjective preferences and choice to get the... The, the barter ratios are the real prices, if you know that kind of terminology, but to get the money prices, they use this different kind of approach altogether. So Mises got rid of that. He just had, he applied the same framework from the 1870s revolution to money itself. So with the time constraints, I can't fully get into what the problem was, but the reason other economists didn't do this before Mises is because they were worried they'd be arguing in a circle. Because if you tried to use subjective preference to explain money's purchasing power, you ended up saying something like, oh, the reason two gold coins, <clears throat> sorry, the reason I would trade my pig for two gold coins is because I think I can use the gold coins to go buy horses. Okay, so it looks like you're saying the reason money is valuable, like why would I give up my pigs for these gold coins, is because money's valuable, because I can use the gold coins to go get horses. So it looks like you're explaining the value of money by reference to the value of money. So it looked like you were just moving in a circle. That's why what was tripping up economists. So how did Mises solve that? Well, first, he introduced the time element. He said, no, you're not arguing in a circle. What you're doing is if you're giving up your labor power or your you know, car or horses or whatever for money, you're selling goods for money, Right now, you're explaining the present purchasing power of money by why would you do that? Because you're expecting the money has purchasing power in the future, right? So you sell your, your goods for money, giving it purchasing power right now, because in your mind, you're predicting the money will have some purchasing power in the future. That's why you're doing it. So it's not moving in a circle. It's explaining the current purchasing power of money by your expectations of the future. And where do you get those predictions from or expectations from? Well, because you just you observed yesterday in the market that gold coins traded for pigs or horses or whatever, so that's where you got those those levels of prices from. And so he he broke it up into a time element, and it looked like you say, okay, it's not a circle, but now it's an infinite regress. You're ultimately saying 
people know how much money's worth because they observed it yesterday, right? And that, that's how you get a sense of what the purchasing power of money is and kind of guide you when you're selling stuff. You know, oh, how much can $100 buy if I go to the store or if I go online? And that kind of guides us, you know, how much work I would do right now for $100 or whatever. So it looks like you're still kind of in, in, in a logical problem where you're explaining today's money prices by reference to yesterday. So how do you get out of that infinite regress? And Mises, it's what's called the regression theorem. So he just traced it back to the point at which you had barter and no money, right? Because Carl Menger had explained how do we go from barter to having money. And so Mises said, okay, we can logically explain the starting point of how money gained purchasing power centuries ago. And now I'm just logically explaining, you know, how, how did it get transmitted down through the ages, if you will. Okay, so I had to kind of go through that quickly, but this is one of the main contributions Mises made was bringing all of economics into one unified framework. Okay, let me now explain to you the Mises Hayek boom bust theory, because this is the thing I want you to take away. And this is where the Austrians and the Chicago School differ. Okay, so the basic theory and then I'll try to zoom in and, and explain the components. But just to give you the big picture, the basic theory of why do we have recessions periodically in a market economy, Mises says it's that there's artificially cheap credit, that the banking system, goaded by a central bank, if we're in a period where there's a central bank, floods the financial sector with uh, artificially cheap credit that makes interest rates lower than they otherwise would be, and that gives a false signal to entrepreneurs they start unsustainable projects. We have an unsustainable boom, but there aren't real resources, and so eventually there's a crash. Okay, so that's the basic story. So it's a story of government intervention in the economy that actually sows the seeds of, of a business cycle. And so the only way to stop that is to get the government out of money and banking and just let market forces govern those processes just like you know, you, you wouldn't want the government heavily regulating the TV industry or the automobile industry. By the same token, Mises thinks it's government involvement in money and banking that ultimately gives us rampant inflation oftentimes, but even if not that, gives us the boom-bust cycle. So how does that come about in the Austrian tradition? Interest rates are market prices that help coordinate activities over time. So just as like the price of crude oil gives us information about the supply and demand for crude oil, and if the price is supposed to be $50 a barrel and the government makes it $30 a barrel somehow, that's not doing us any favors. That's the wrong signal. By the same token, if the interest rate's supposed to be 3% on a bond of certain you know, riskiness, and the government comes in and somehow makes that only 1%, people think, oh, that's, that's good. The Fed's helping us out by making credit cheaper no, that's not helping us out. That, that, that 3% meant something, and you're giving the wrong signal to people. And so, again, the, the easy money to artificially low interest rates spurs an unsustainable boom. But notice, just by pumping in money into the financial sector, lowering interest rates, there's not more real resources. There's not more farmland. There's not more factories. Programmers don't have more knowledge. Brain surgeons you know, can't do more surgeries per day just because the Fed creates money out of thin air and buys assets with it. Okay, so we're not actually richer. And so if it seems like that generated prosperity by the Fed creating money out of thin air effectively and making interest rates lower, that can't be right. That's got to be wrong. So that sows the seeds of an unsustainable boom and bust. So the best um, analogy I've seen for Mises talking about this is his master builder analogy, all right? And he says, so, this, so again, this is a metaphor Mises would use to explain his business cycle theory. So imagine there's a builder constructing a house, and suppose he, had, he thinks he has more bricks than he really does, right? So all the lumber and shingles and glass and whatever and bricks are on site, and the guy has blueprints and workers, you know, who are going to follow his orders, and he's building this house, and maybe the blueprints assume there's 5,000 bricks, but really there's only 4,000. That's the scenario. So when's the best time for him to discover the mistake? As soon as possible, right? The longer he persists with the original blueprint that's not sustainable, the worse condition he's going to be in. Now, what happens when he does realize there's a mistake? 
the first thing, you know, so his blueprints think there's still 1,800 bricks left, and really there's only 800 bricks left. He realized that he's going to pull out the bullhorn and say, everyone, stop working. Stop right now because we need to reevaluate. And he's going to get the blueprint out, look at the resources left, look at the half-finished house, and then figure out how do we make the best of this situation, okay? And the last component, what if in this scenario – the master builders in the midst of revising the blueprints saying, geez, what do we do now? We've got this half-finished house. We don't have enough stuff to finish it the way it was designed. What do we do? And he's fiddling with it. And there's a gazebo there that's being built, and there's a bunch of lumber and bricks and whatever, and there's workers just sitting around doing nothing because they're waiting for the guy to finish revising the blueprints. And a politician walks up. He's like, oh, there's idle resources. He says, hey, you guys, get here. Here, here's some $50 bills. I'm going to pay you as a politician. Take those and finish that gazebo. And so they, okay, they take the bricks and they finish the gazebo. And then he puts a sign up, it's called, you know, the F Frank Smith gazebo. And everyone then drives by us and says, man, I'm glad that Frank Smith politician put those idle resources to work because the market had failed us. Right? And you see that that would be the wrong thing to do. That if you're just looking at the, what's in front of your face, it would look like the market wasn't using those resources. And thank goodness that politician put them to work doing something like building a gazebo. But you see, though, that was taking resources away from where they were more urgently needed. So that's the metaphor for if the economy is in a recession, the reason is that it was on an unsustainable trajectory. Firm, some firms were doing something they shouldn't have done. They were sucking resources into lines that were unsustainable. They needed to stop. Those workers needed to be laid off. And it, it takes time to then get reallocated to where they should be. Okay, And so... In, during that adjustment period, yeah, it can look like the economy has failed, but again, the problem was the earlier unsustainable boom, and you're not doing any favors. The government runs pump priming programs, you know, make make work programs to build bridges or something that really shouldn't be built. You're just sucking those resources away precisely at the time when the economy is already on the ropes. Okay, let me just wrap up by explaining why is Mises so iconic in our day, besides his scholarly contributions, he inspired many disciples to join him. For one thing, he's got a gripping personal tale. I don't have time to get into the details here, but he, he was in you know, Austria, Germany. He fled the Nazis because he was a threat to them. He was Jewish, but also a, a champion of the free market and classical liberalism, so he was a persona non grata to them. He went to Switzerland and ultimately came to the United States, right? And so there's it's a a very heroic tale of his personal courage. And he also wrote passionately for the layperson. So let me end, and then we'll turn over to your guys' questions, with this quotation from Mises, just again to show you some of the stuff he would write for the layperson. Because he knew, unlike, let, let's say, quantum physics, a lot of lay people don't understand that, but it doesn't matter. That engineers and physicists, they can still make computers that run on quantum physics. You can still send satellites into space. And all you care about is that your iPhone works. You don't need to know why it works, right? You can think, yeah, I don't believe in that two-slit experiment stuff. That's a bunch of hope. It doesn't matter what you think that. All that matters is that your thing works. But if the public doesn't believe in the principles of economics and the market economy and they think socialism works, that can screw things up because then they might vote for politicians who interfere with private property. Okay, so that's the sense in which Mises thought it's crucial that the general public learns at least the basics of economics. So let me end with this quote from Mises. He says, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of his share of responsibility by others. And no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping towards destruction. Therefore, everyone in his own interest must thrust himself vigorously in the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern. The interest of everyone hangs in the result. Whether he chooses or not, every man is drawn into the great historical struggle the decisive battle into which our epic has plunged us. Okay, so thanks everyone for your attention and I'll wait your questions. Okay, great, now this microphone's working again. Okay, great. great. Okay, is our question and answer time? Uh, we have two microphones going around the room. If you don't speak into the microphone, uh, people watching the live stream can't hear you and it's harder for people around the room. Uh, to hear you as well. So just please put your hand up, and when the microphone comes to you, please um, identify who you, uh, yourself, so that uh, Bob know who, knows who he's speaking to. And uh, we'll start right over here.
Okay, yes. Do you want me to repeat them for so these Please. people? Yeah. So uh, the issue, he, the question was, the economics is a well-developed branch of praxeology. How come there's not other ones? I have seen some people in, in the tradition of Mises try to talk about other ones. Like, for example, Rothbard um, tries to develop, like, the, the logic of, of uh, violent behavior in, in his book called Power and Market. So he tries to give, like, a typology of different sorts of, you know, aggression against property and things like that. So that's clearly not something that happens on a, on a pure market economy where, you know, property rights are respected. So I have seen some people dabble in those areas, but, but you're right, it, it's not as, as well developed. Also, I think some people might, could argue that other branches fall under, you know, like certain, maybe a certain approach to sociology or criminology conceivably could work on these lines, um, but you're right, I don't know that in practice a lot of people have, have done that. Hi, my name is Barrett Wadick. Um, and my question is, I'm, I'm just curious, your, your opinion on the long-term effects of the Roosevelt, the stimulus, the stimulus and all the stuff that he did during the Great Depression, like how has that negatively affected our economy? Like how long-term has that affected us and are we still suffering from the policies he implemented during the, the Great Depression? Okay, great, yeah, so um, I would point you to m my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression, where I talk about this stuff. I wish I could hold up, Ding. but um, l let me explain. So in the Austrian story, the Federal Reserve in the 1920s had an easy credit policy that caused the stock market bubble. So the, the 1929 crash, you, Austrians, loosely speaking, would blame on the Fed and say that was, that was because, you know, the easy credit. But if, the, if the, gov the federal government's response to that had just been literally to do nothing, what people said Herbert Hoover did, but he didn't in fact do, so Herbert Hoover, in his memoirs, you, you kind of feel bad for the guy. He's saying, I get this bum rap like I did nothing. No, I was the most interventionist president in U.S. history. And I was like, yeah, you jerk. That's what happened, right? But so, you know, you could see where he was coming from, thinking, why is everyone thinking I did nothing? I did, it's not true. And, and so it was the interventions of Hoover and then FDR that made what should have just been a bad boom bust that would have worked itself out in 18 months. You know, so, so that's one way of looking at it. How come previous financial panics or depressions with a small d didn't end up being as awful as the Great Depression? It's because those earlier U.S. presidents really did nothing, more or less. It was precisely because of the New Deal and the stuff that Hoover did, which anticipated the New Deal, that made the thing draw out. So if you're saying, you know, what was the long-lasting damages? Well, I'm right now working on, a, on a, an article, how do we get out of this $11 trillion Social Security hole, right? So a lot of the stuff that FDR instituted is still with us, you know, to this day. Things like um, de deposit insurance for commercial banks, stuff like that, I think, you know, it was the wrong way to go that sort of got you through the immediate crisis, but by doing something that sowed the seeds for, you know, now we're still seeing problems in the banking sector. A lot of them, I think, going back to the fact that banks are in this weird thing where the government bails them out of their mistakes, and so then they have to regulate them on the front end to kind of keep them from doing bad stuff and they're always behind the times. Hi, Liliana Fargo. Um, I actually teach at DePaul University, uh, so I understand a little bit of uh, your um, lecture. <laughs> but uh, in any case, so uh, um, following the uh, boom boss theory of Mises and Hayek, I guess the implication will be that uh, in a nation we shouldn't have someone like the central bank uh, manipulating interest rates because that will create most, um, mostly um, inefficiencies. Um, and, but um, at the same time, I think in Washington, even among Republicans, I don't think there is much sympathy for the idea of eliminating, uh, for example, the Federal Reserve. Maybe only Rand Paul will mm -hmm. be a supportive of that idea. And uh, among Republicans, I mean, even Trump would suggest that the, the way to solve national debt uh, issues is by printing more. <laughs> right. So it's kind of concerning that that's the view in Washington. Now, what is your perspective? Do you think that will be a good idea, the elimination of the Federal Reserve and replacing that with a, an alternative system? Y yes, and it's funny you brought up Ron Paul because when he was running for president, I thought, just shows that I'm a bad politician, I thought, oh, s just... Talk about legalizing drugs and pulling the troops home. That's what college kids, and instead they're going, end the Fed, end the Fed, you know, and it's 
because I taught college level, and like when I talk about monetary policy, the kids wanted to die. So I was, it was amazing. He made it cool and sexy to talk about the Fed, but. Um, <laughs> So, I, I, yes, ultimately, I do think that that's, that would be the way to go. Now, if you're saying, okay, if they got rid of the Fed next Thursday, wouldn't that be problematic? Yeah, it would. But, again, I think that it's ultimately the Fed that's driving these boom-bust cycles. I mean, if you keep going back, just to give you guys an idea, so there was the tech bubble in, in the late 90s, and then that crashed, and then what did they do? The Fed blew up the housing bubble, which was bigger and worse. You know. So what, what happened in 2008 in the financial crisis if at that moment you said, okay, instead of being right where we are, what if we just went back and had the tech bubble and we rolled that thing out, everybody would say, oh yeah. And so I'm concerned with all these rounds of QE that when the next crisis hits, it's gonna make 2008 say, oh, wasn't that great when it was just like investment banks that were going down and not countries? You know, whereas now it's conceivable the next crisis hits, the Euro might fail or something. So it's like they keep kicking the can down and making these crises get bigger and bigger and they solve it by printing money to get through the immediate thing, but then 10 years later it comes back and it's even worse. So I agree if they ended the Fed that there'd be, there'd be a crash, but I don't, I don't think if we keep the Fed we're going to avoid a crash. I think it's just that you keep making it worse and, and worse. So that, that would be my answer. In the, in the book, Choice, I, I carefully go through the theory of what's called free banking and how actually the, the market economy, if you just had regular rules of contract and private property and you had banks in that framework, just like you know pizza shops and uh, other sorts of regular businesses, if banks were just you know had to adhere to the property laws that that would actually constrain them. you wouldn't have the inflation problem that's central banking with its lender of last resort feature that actually lets banks operate irresponsibly. <laughs> Is it a problem that I'm this close to the speaker? <laughs> um, my name is Nick, spelled N-I-K, Swedish spelling. Um, I'm aware that Austrians acknowledge that it's extremely difficult to time the market. So it's, it's, but it's one thing to predict that a crash will happen, and then people will say, well, yeah, if you say that a crash is always about to happen, then you're never wrong. A broken clock is right twice a day. but if we know that another crash is coming, what are the ways that professional Austrians figure out how, when it's going to come? Okay, yeah, that's it. And my name's Bob, B-O-B, -B, just so you know. Um, it's the Irish spelling. The, uh, so yeah, when's the crash gonna happen? In the future. You might write that down. Uh, I, I understand what you're, what you're saying, and uh, I should acknowledge, I was wrong on price inflation. I thought we were gonna see CPI inflation higher than we saw it in fact. So I, this is the only time you're ever gonna see this following sentence, I'm an economist and I was wrong about something, right? You're never gonna hear that again the rest of your life. Um, so you're, you're right, there is that issue. But if you go and, for example, if you guys have access to, uh, if you just go to the St. Louis Fed website, it's called FRED, it's like free charting service, so you figure out how to use, use it. Just look at the, what's called the monetary base against the S&P 500 and look at it from like 2009 onward, up until about six months ago, they moved hand in glove, that every time there was QE, the S&P 500 zoomed up and vice versa. And so it really fits pretty nicely. So um, what I would say is now that the Fed's raising rates and they're, they're doing other things like reverse repos and such that make the monetary base go down, um, yeah, I think that you're gonna see the market come down. If that if that divergence continues for a while, then I, I am going to think I got to re rethink my framework. But up till now, it's behaved the way you would expect that when the Fed's inflating. And also, since the fall of 2014, the monetary base was flat. Actually, Yellen, just to make sure you guys know, Bernanke was an inflationist. Yellen actually was kind of just, she oversaw the tapering and so on. And the S&P was just kind of bouncing around for two years, right? So the, it, it kind of fits the, the pattern of the market was following what the Fed was doing, so if, if now they shrink the monetary base, you, I would expect the market to come down. So you, it doesn't give you a crystal ball because you don't know what the Fed's going to do, but it certainly kind of does tell you how is the Fed's behavior going to affect things. Next question's right here, but please raise your hand so somebody can get to you next. Yeah, yeah Bob, um, I'm not sure this question is going to be quite on target. If it's not, uh, don't, don't respond. But do you have any views on Bitcoin? as an alternative currency? Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, I actually have written a, a guide to Bitcoin 
Um, and so if you go to the website, understandingbitcoin.us, it's a free PDF where we explain the economics and the, the basics of it. And the reason you'd say, how come you did understanding Bitcoin.us? Because .com was taken, that's why. Um, and so that's where it is. And yeah, I think, I, I'm not telling people to invest in it. It's, it's really volatile, but I do think either Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies going forward, people are gonna rush into that just because as they see like the government kind of money and there's more lockdown on you know, currency controls and stuff. I think a lot of people are gonna say, you know, all I have to do is remember a, a password or a code and I can move a lot of wealth you know, through a decentralized network. I think a lot of people, especially in countries with tyrannical governments, are going to do that. Understandingbitcoin.us. You know, um, my name is Betty, but what you were talking about, the economists, very few economists say that they're wrong. Uh, there's so many of them that none of them get the timing right. I mean, Peter Schiff has for the longest time been talking about the price of gold going up, going up. So you might, it, it, it's, it's possible to understand all of this in terms of a long period of time. You predict a crash maybe 10, 15 years. But in terms of any kind of timing that a person could actually use for investing or for knowing it's really difficult. I mean, do you know of any economist who has really been close to being able to time anything? Well, the, uh, no. <laughs> the, and while well, the problem is some of them could be right on something like Peter Schiff looked like a genius in 2009, right? Because he, he, there's things, if you guys haven't seen it, go to YouTube and do Peter Schiff was right, and it's S-C-H-I-F-F. -F. And the stuff he was saying in 2006 was like great in terms of describing what was gonna happen with the housing market and everything. And people were literally laughing in his face. So he looked great, but you're right. Then he thought, oh, so that means the dollar's going to fall. And da, da. So I think what happened with Schiff was he understood what was going to happen in the U.S. He didn't think about, oh, wait a minute, but if Europe tanks too, people are going to rush to the dollar for safety. So even though everything I said about the U.S. housing market turned out right, the dollar perversely strengthened because everyone around the world was panicked. So... Uh, variables and right. you cannot predict all the variables so many things going on that any one of them could could tip anything anyway so even if you, we understand basic economics or we understand what's going on it really doesn't help a lot in terms of investing or in terms of actually what to do with your life financially it's it's a very difficult thing yeah I mean the one safe thing you could do is just give a lot of your money to the Heartland Institute all I right think there you that go <laughs> I had a question about the Bitcoin, but yeah. I had a statement that which probably is a question as well. What's her name? Oh, my name is Carl Lambrecht. I come from Highland Park, Illinois. I uh, lived for a considerable amount of my time in Soviet Union. And one of the guys working with me said, a factory was asked to produce something which cost a uh, dollar on the market, a pot. And they wanted to buy 100 pieces. The director of the factory thought and said, these guys must be rich, so I'll sell them for a dollar and twenty cents a piece, and uh, that's a pretty well controlled economy when they can increase the price for the larger quantity, which logically should be cheaper. Right. Uh, what do you think about an economy that's that well controlled? Y yeah. So, and I did, I should mention one of the most important contributions Mises made was his critique of socialism. But just with the time we had, I, I wanted to focus on the business cycle stuff. But yeah, Mises had a critique saying that um, the, the fundamental problem with the socialist economy, even if the incentives were, even if the workers did everything that they were ordered to do, even if the planners you know, weren't corrupt and they really wanted to help their subjects, they, just, they would lack genuine market prices. So they, they would not have the, the information that market prices give. So they wouldn't know, even ex post, are we doing the right thing? That yeah, a factory... They could have engineers and, and physicists and chemists tell them, yeah, we've got this much metal coming in the front end and glass and rubber and so on. The, the workers show up and this many cars come out the other end of the factory every month. But if they then said, is that an economic use of resources? Is that a good thing? Should we keep doing that? They would have no way of knowing, right? Because it's not even enough to say, well, do our people seem to like these cars? What if we could make other things with those same resources that people would like more? Right, so it's not enough that they like the cars, it's that do they like the cars, is that the best thing we could do with these resources? So yes, that fundamental mismatch is the problem. I heard other anecdotes, I think kind of similar to yours, where 
some of this might be apocryphal, but along the lines of if the you know the factory gets the order from the the people at the top, you know, the head of the Communist Party saying you need to produce whatever a thousand kilograms worth of these screws per day or something, and they just realize they just make one giant screw. That's a thousand kilograms, right? So there you go. Right, because if all they care about is following the bureaucratic rule, not satisfying their customers, then they'll figure out what's the cheapest way for us to do that. So Pete Becky um, has done some work on this stuff, and they arguing that the reason, it's almost like when you, when you really get how bad socialism is, you wonder how come those people just all didn't starve to death. And a lot of them did starve, obviously, as you, as you know, but part of it was just saying, well, actually, they would, you know, they resort to the black market, that a lot of it was they wouldn't actually do the rules. There was a lot of, you know, corruption, people doing stuff behind the scenes, and that's kind of how the, the, the system groped along. But, but you're right, officially, it just leads to craziness. I have many stories like that. Okay. <laughs> we have a question in the back, but please raise your hand if you'd like to be next. So, my name's Anthony Siani. I'm here from uh, Palatine. Um, so first, I'd, I'd like to say, I think you were correct about the CPI. It's just that you couldn't foresee that we would have a, an explosion of free energy to offset mm -hmm. the explosion of free money. Um, and then as, as to the question, so one of the, the issues I have is uh, competing against other schools of economics. Uh, for example, uh, I think this last year or the year before, we had a panel of socialist Smithites that um, uh, embraced some rather, I think, shoddy research that uh, proclaimed action was an illusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think you're aware of that for people who aren't. I, I'm referring to the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, it, it was a research, by the way, I dismissed in a 10 second argument and rather convincingly. Um, but, uh, you know, how do we how do we convince people that um, that economics is not necessarily a zero-sum game, that there is a uh, time-based loss, that the, uh, shall we say, that the Austrian school is the correct school. Okay, um, how did you dismiss it, by the way? Did you just say something like, well, what reason do we have to believe you? You're just up there flailing around, you know, you're, you're not even thinking because you can't control your actions? Uh, no, no I, I, asked, um, I asked the physicist who was arguing on the other side, and when was the last time that you decided to spontaneously spend money on something just because? Right, okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, as, as far as your, I mean, in terms of getting value across and that's not a zero sum game, I mean, something as simple as, so this is one way I try to get a, someone to see the difference between like objective features of goods versus the subjective value. If you have two kids at lunch and one's got a peanut butter sandwich and one a bologna sandwich, and you say, which of these, you know, it, it can't be that both students walk away with a sandwich that has more calories. That, that one, they might both think that, but one of them's wrong, right? There's an objective fact, which of these sandwiches, or they walk, it can't be that both walk away with a sandwich that is heavier. That can't be true. One of the sandwiches is heavier, you know, that's it, because that's an objective feature. Whereas it is possible if the kids, you know, say, oh, I wish I had peanut butter, and the other kid says, oh, I wish I had a bologna sandwich, so you let's trade they can both walk away with, with the better sandwich, the sandwich that has more value. And that's not a contradiction because value is in the mind of the beholder. So that just a simple little example like that shows how trade is a win-win or a positive sum game, that it's not that if one person walks away winning, then the other person must feel like a loser, that that doesn't need to happen. But again, it's because value is subjective. So you know, that, that simple little insight and then you, just, you build a, upon from there. One field in the last couple of decades is uh, behavioral economics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, writers like Daniel Kahneman. Uh, what impact uh, does, is that having on current economic theory? Okay, yeah. So there's um, a lot of work where um, economists are ch the way you would hear it reported is oh, economists like in the behavioral research and what's like saying what's called behavioral economics or some people might call it like psychology and economics, the intersection of these things, is they will say, oh, they're overturning like the postulates of standard economic theory. And maybe people aren't as rational as we thought, or this, this throws into no doubt all of the conclusions of standard economics that you learn in you know, fundamental intro classes. And that may be true for the kind of stuff you would get if you went to you know, MIT or something and learned economics there, 
but it, it doesn't apply. That, that stuff's all perfectly compatible with the kind of economics that Mises taught, for example, so Austrian economics. So like I said, when Mises talks about rational choice, the word rational just means you're using reason to try to achieve an end. So if you see people doing a rain dance because they want it to rain and they, they want the crops to grow, that's not irrational. It's, no, there, there's a reason for what they're doing. It might be wrong to, in our mind, but he would say that's action. Okay, so in Mises' view, economic science is, is not dependent on assumptions about the way people make decisions or anything like that. And so Austrian economics is largely not susceptible to the critiques of the, what's called behavioral economics. Hello, I'm Andrea Wadick from Wakanda, Illinois. And I was wondering if you would talk about the socialism that's in Europe, Germany, the Scandinavian countries. A lot of young people seem to think this is a good option. These people here are happy and they have everything they need. And we've, we were in Canada on vacation and they even told us, we like our system you know, here. Uh -huh. We like it because everyone is taken care of. And so can you talk about how these countries seem to be thriving and seem to be happy, yet it seems you would say the economics they're following are faulty? Okay, uh, so, so one thing is, I, yes, a lot of people throw it around, and like Bernie Sanders, you know, Times made it sound like, oh yeah, they got socialism over there in Europe, and then one time somebody pinned him down and said, well, what do you mean when you say you're a socialist? And he goes, no, I just mean like I want to help people. I was like, okay, well then I'm a socialist too, if that's what that means. But um, so I think you know, it's it's important to be a little bit care more careful. I think a lot of times, really, what they mean is like um, welfare state economies or you know market economies that have a lot of intervention in a big social safety net, if you will, that it's not really socialism per se in a lot of these places. Um, right here, like off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to, to give you a lot of specifics. I do think there are, um, I would point you to this, if you go and, and Google uh, Contra Krugman Scandinavian countries, um, Tom Woods and I have this podcast called Contra Krugman where we take on the arguments of Paul Krugman every week. And so yeah, one time he was holding up I don't remember if it was Sweden or Norway or something is like this, yeah, this excellent example. And so we went through point by point and tried to address those arguments, all right? So um, right now, I, I, I have not looked at the data recently, so I don't want to misspeak, but I, I do think it, so I don't agree with, with those statements. Also, too, I think a lot of places, the, you're comparing apples to oranges, okay? That um, it's like the, the demographics or whatever in the United States don't match up with in some of these other places. And so it's, it's not obvious that it's a fair comparison of their institutions versus ours. Uh, Larry Greenberg, I come from Skokie, uh, originally from Brooklyn, New York, where uh, every child um, by the age of, let's say, junior high, understands that some things have more value than others, and that you can, that if you have more of something, uh, it's usually going to be cheaper. And so there is a, an obvious understanding of the market that kids have. So, what, so I'm asking you this question as a college educator. By the time you get college students, um, most of them are socialists. Mm -hmm. Where have we gone wrong in the educational system? Why is that understanding suppressed dust? Yeah. Well, I, I blame you. I think you should be doing a better job. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, you're right, it's, we're doing like triage that we're getting people in trying to say, whoa, you've been filling oh, uh, that's what they think, because that's how the press talks. Everyone just assumes, yeah, the way to jump, uh-oh, consumers aren't spending enough at the mall. It's, you know, economists are worried because such and such, right? So we're learning, oh, the reason the is certainly an element, but I think, you know, I went to a, a private school and I was taught all kinds of wrong history too. I thought that the free market caused the Great Depression. So I think that's, I guess, yeah, bad, bad history probably is, is what I would say in terms of young people, they grow up. If you're taught the free market was tried in the 20s and it failed miserably, you know, who are you to doubt your teacher telling you that? We have time, we have time for a couple more questions, um, so please raise your hand if you have one. And I have one, speaking of junk economics. Uh, you raise your hand. Okay. My name is Jim Lakely, I am from Lake Zurich, Illinois. Did you forget? <laughs> oh, I just moved there. I forgot for a second. From Pittsburgh, PA, and I try to think about where am I He's from originally. He's trying to remember what so, his cover you know. story is. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm Jim. Well, speaking of not knowing what I'm talking about, Paul Krugman. 
I can't think of a popular economist who's more wrong than him because I read and listen to your podcast, all sorts of people explaining how wrong he is about everything. How the hell did he get a Nobel Prize? Okay, that's a good question. So for those who don't know, uh, Paul Krugman, he has a column of the New York Times. He's probably the world's leading Keynesian or at least expositor of Keynesian views. Um, so he was a, a trade theorist and he, he wrote a lot of great stuff even for the layperson in the 90s like essays explaining the logic of free trade and t tackling you know, standard objections to it and stuff like that. He even like, was highly critical of Robert Reich back then. And then what happened is he got the New York Times column and George W. Bush became president. And at some point, Krugman just flipped. And I think he just, you know, people give different theories, but clearly you can tell there's like two Krugmans, the economist from the night. He wasn't like a, a right winger in the 90s, but he was more of a mainstream economists talking about the logic of economics and how conventional attitudes you know are often wrong and stuff like that and then now he's it, it's like he's a you know he was a cheerleader for hillary clinton and it was like he was very partisan so um to answer your question the work so he he won it for his work on trade theory and the the trade theory was it it, it was respectable i was putting you know, so that's not my area but I, i've read you know what he got it for and it was not the stuff that you would think of now as being the work of Paul Krugman as epitomizing the New York Times column, that he, he did um, you know, advance the academic mathematical models of the economy and international trade theory, and that's what officially the prize was for. However, a lot of cynics think the reason the Nobel Committee gave it to Krugman was because they wanted to give him a better platform to criticize George W. Bush. So there, I mean, you can't get inside the minds of people, but that wouldn't surprise me if they had something to do with why did they give it to him but the reasons they said for why they gave it to him were not crazy. If you say so. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of prizes, uh, if you have any more questions for our guest tonight, uh, Bob Murphy, uh, you can talk to him while he signs your book. If you haven't yet purchased it, we may have a few left, but a lot of people have bought them. Hold this up for the camera so people can see it. How about that? All right. Great. And um, so uh, let's give our, our speaker a round of applause, please. Very good. Keep it up there. That's very good. <laughs> and so, um, I'm sorry, we have a... Can I just say one thing? Ariana? This group, so, this group is so vitally important, bringing in speakers like this. This group is needed. Uh, I recently heard Thomas Friedman speak at Aurora University, and he said, if Trump does anything on climate change and opposes it, I'm going to write about it and do everything. I'm working with major corporations who have signed on to the uh, uh, UN and Obama climate change. Somebody's got to speak out. This group does, and on other issues. So this is an extremely important group, and I tip my hat to all of you and our speakers, so thank you. Well, thank you for that great endorsement of the Heartland Institute. Very much appreciated. Donate. Yeah, do <laughs> donate would be great. All right, and so uh, actually, so now we're back in the regular uh, schedule of, of Heartland events, which are usually Wednesday nights. Next week is School Choice Week, which is held, which is uh, celebrations all across the country. Heartland's been participating in School Choice Week for many years now. We're having uh, Jamie Gass from the Pioneer Institute. He's going to be talking about Blaine Amendments, uh, which basically have that the left has used to sever uh, private schools from any any even tangential support from the public, which didn't used to be the case for generations, but they've kind of put a wedge in there to, to uh, prevent that from happening and prevent the growth of parochial and private schools. So if you want to learn a lot more about that and its history, please see us here next Wednesday night, same time and same channel. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time.